this is the single hardest decision I've ever had to make in, well, in, in, in my business career and certainly in my time at Raspberry Pi. What am I not sorry we didn't do? I'm not sorry that we didn't float the price. I think it's very unfair of you not to let me rewind history by three years because that's what <laughs> you actually need to do in order to make a difference. This month, I interviewed Evan Upton at Raspberry Pi's headquarters in Cambridge. Evan is an engineer and the co-founder of Raspberry Pi. Now, to be clear, Raspberry Pi didn't pay for my trip. The whole thing was financed by my Patreon and GitHub supporters and by this video's sponsor, PiShop.us. More on them later. The first topic, the Pi shortage. I think, I think one of the challenges you have is that a lot of the um, manufacturing capabilities which are upstream of us are running, normally run very, very close to capacity. No one wants to have a factory, no one wants to have a semiconductor fab, say, that's running at 90% capacity. Everyone wants a factory that's running at 99% capacity. So you have a, um, I guess, resilience, resilience, redundancy, and efficiency, they fight against each other. Uh, what that means is if you get a little bit behind, which is what happened as a result of some of the things that happened in, in 2020, if you get a little bit behind, it can be almost impossible to catch up. Um, that, of course, has also been compounded. The, the underlying shortage, the, uh, sort of the, un the underlying sort of true shortage, I guess does, as we saw with a number of other things like toilet paper in this country, once there's a perception that there's shortage, people's behavior changes. So people start to exhibit stockpile, particularly stockpiling behavior. People start to uh, want to hold contingency stock of components. And so quite often the, the actual underlying shortage gets magnified by some of the behaviors that people have in, 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 response, to, uh, in response to the shortage. The shortages take a toll on the whole Pi community, individual makers, students, and businesses that use Pies. But it's also been tough on the resellers, resellers like PiShop.us, who generously sponsored this video. They actually have been getting more Pies to sell lately, and they've always had tons of stock of Pico kits. They sell to home, education, and industry. And fun fact, I bought my first Raspberry Pi 4 from them. When I asked them about sponsoring this video, they told me from their reseller's perspective, the Pi supply is definitely getting better this year. In fact, they've been getting batches of Pi Zero W pretty regularly, and soon, they couldn't promise an exact date, but soon, they'll be opening the floodgates for ordering as many Pi Zeros as you need. And that's great news. Definitely check them out. I know I've bought a number of pies and accessories from them, and their customer support has always been top-notch, especially when I started asking about compute module availability way back in 2020. And I even got to talk with Evan about that. People like me who did buy pies before the shortage started. We talked about the idea of attrition in 2023. One of the things that has enabled people to sort of survive through this period of shortage is exactly that, is, people, is, is that people came into this shortage situation holding lots and lots and lots of Raspberry Pis already. So to some extent, for a limited period of time, people can survive a transient shortage by, just as a, a company might survive a transient shortage, by having some buffer of supply, some buffer of inbound componentry. So a hobbyist can survive for a period of time, um, uh, by using the Raspberry Pis they already have. It's interesting you go look on, on, on uh, Reddit though, what you see is people now increasingly talking about attrition. They're talking about, I had, I came into this with 15 Raspberry Pis and I've now blown up five of my Raspberry Pis doing projects. Now I'm down to 10 Raspberry Pis. If this carries on for another, you can draw a line. If this carries on for another year, then I'm down, gonna be down to zero Raspberry Pis. Yeah. So it's only ever, a, that's only ever, a, you know, for, for companies or for individuals, that, that, that's only ever a temporary solution. In, in December last year, you. You said that it would be quarter two, quarter three would be coming back, quarter four, you'd be able to go anywhere and buy one. Yeah. Is, is that still something that- That's about right. So quarter one this year was our worst quarter in terms of production and shipment. I, quarter one, partly because we pulled quite a lot of production into the Christmas period because we wanted people to have a reasonably good Christmas. But quarter one this year was our, low, our, our lowest output quarter, I think, since Q3 of 2015, right? You've got to go back a long way. We did about 750 uh, to 800,000 units in Q1 this year. Um, and so yeah, you have to go look back a long way before you find a quarter where we did that. And it's incredible, it's still incredible to me that I'm talking about that as being not many Raspberry Pis, right? Yeah, you talk to Evan of 2012 yeah. and tell him <laughs> you sold a quarter of a million, half yeah. a million, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to be like, wait, in how many years? Yeah, yeah that's it's right. One, and, one month. I know, there, is a, there is a kind of, there, there's a, mis there is a, uh, a misperception. Uh, um, you know, people um, imagine that because you can't freely buy a Raspberry Pi, we must, the only possible explanation of that must be we are making zero Raspberry Pis. You're actually making a very large number of Raspberry Pis, you know, sort of in a bad quarter, you're not far off making 10,000 Raspberry Pis a yeah. day. Um, but it's because, of course, you have you have backlog everywhere. You have industrial customers who have backlog. You have individuals who will um, 
who are watching our who are, who are waiting in queues at the proof tree sellers refreshing, who are, refreshing every Wednesday. you know subscribe to our pie locator um uh you know um the demand as, as supply becomes available for you know until you get back to a really really healthy level of supply which is kind of where we're getting this quarter even quite large amounts of production just get swallowed up by backlog as we get back to supply and demand hopefully equalizing yeah. Like, what do you think will be the volume at that point? Well, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating question. Right? I don't know how big my business is, right? I haven't been, I've been in constraint for two years now. So we did 6 million units in 2019, 7 million units in 2020. Obviously, 2020 was a strange year, but it was an unconstrained year for us. So we were able to produce enough. So we, we entered that year, we normally run about a half million unit backlog. Which is, which is about a month's backlog. Mm-hmm. That's fairly sort of that's that's not unhealthy. Um, went into 2020 with a half million unit backlog. Came out of 2020 with a half million unit backlog. Went into 2021 with a half million unit backlog. Came out of 2021 having sold another seven million units with a four and a half million <laughs> unit backlog. Um, and so you can and you can't just add those numbers together. So you can't. Uh, yeah, I mentioned um, people's behaviour changing when there's a perception that there's a shortage. Clearly, that extra, that 4 million delta, you don't just get to add 7 million and 4 million and say we were an 11 million unit business. If there hadn't been a shortage, you wouldn't have got the 4 million units. But it does feel like we were probably not a 7 million unit mm-hmm. um, uh, business. We actually had a very, very healthy first quarter that year. We saw, we saw, saw demand going up and then it was really that. The story of that year was about not being able to scale supply up to meet increased demand. And then sadly, then last year, the story was about actual supply going down. So last year, we then did 5 million units. And that's 5 million units, even after kind of ducking for the line. And we really did duck for the line in December. We still only did 5 million units. Um, then Q1 of this year, between 750 and 800,000, so that's an annualized rate of barely 3 million units. Now, the interesting thing about this year is we probably have capacity to do a 10 million unit year. If we had to, we probably won't have to, but we could do a 10 million unit year. But all, but, you know, over if we did a 10 million unit year, more than nine million of that would be packed into the last nine months of the year. So you, you know, that what that that year would look like <laughs> three months of two hundred and fifty thousand, and then nine months of a million units a month. I think we we are where we said we'd be in December, which is mm-hmm. fairly lousy first quarter. Um, a second quarter, which will be about two million units, which is a pre-pandemic quarter, which is great, but obviously still catching up with the backlog. Then a third and fourth quarter, which are broadly speaking unconstrained, yeah, you know, certainly by chip supply. I mean, you actually will eventually hit factory manufacturing capacity uh, limitations. Yeah. But I expect that we will have um, satisfied or you know, um, wound down all of our backlogs and got everything into general availability before we bump into a factory capacity and, limit. And I have seen. Pi 3, A plus in stock pretty much in many places now. Pretty much continuously for yeah. several months now. So and the zero has been coming back. Actually, I think there's a reasonable chance zero two might actually come back for good. So zero is in a better availability position than it was. Um, but zero two is, I think, going to take on. Um, we've, um, remember, zero two is powered by this chip, this device called RP3A0, which is a Broadcom processor die and a Micron uh, memory packaged together by us. Um, into our own into our own custom SIP, um, we actually got a lot of wafer supply um, and uh, manufacturing test capacity for that. Now, the interesting thing about Zero Two is because it it's really a child of the shortage, right? It kind of came along just as the shortage really kicked in, so it hasn't really accumulated industrial demand yet. It's too it's too young, and for most of its life, it's been very 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 supply constrained. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it hasn't accumulated industrial demand. So all of that supply, and that's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of units of supply. They will all go into 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 hobbyist and education. Um, so zero has got more supply, but it's also got more industrial demand. Zero two has smaller but still significant supply, uh, but no industrial demand. So I think those two will probably race each other. Three A plus will stay in for, for for all time now. Zero and zero two will race each other, um, and then we really start to see substantial sort of recovery in three B and three B plus, uh, and then in Pi four. Um, as we go through into the, into the, towards the end of this quarter. The Pi blog post was pretty accurate, just with a few slight tweaks to when certain Pies are coming back in stock. So I switched tracks and asked Evan about the level of anger that's present in the community. Right now, a lot of people in my comment section say, well, I'm never going to use a Raspberry Pi again. But... I think for a lot of those people, they would if they yeah. could get one. Yeah. I think it's just there. There's anger. Do you? Look, it's completely understandable anger. I, I, I think I've talked about this a lot, and this is 
this is the single hardest decision I've ever had to make in well in, in, in my business career and certainly in my time at Raspberry Pi. It is it's extremely hard to decide when you are a hobbyist as I am and you built this thing for hobbyist in education to prioritize a different market right I think it's, re it's really important to emphasize that when we talk about industry we're not talking about IBM. We're not talking about multi-billion, heavily diversified multi-billion dollar international companies. Our median, we have a few of those, but um, our median customer is uh, about a 3,000, the OEM customer is about 3,000 boards a year. So these are often one, two, five, ten employee mom, mom and pop shops building some specific thing on Raspberry Pi. If they can't get Raspberry Pi, they have no real alternatives um, and they'll go to the wall. They'll go bust. Right. And so the real question when people are saying, should you do this prioritization call is, should I zero some of those customers or, or constrain them so heavily that they go out of business or take very, very serious damage? And it, it didn't feel like the moral thing to do. Um, uh, but it, it just because I think we did the right thing. Um, I think a lot of people recognize that we did the right thing or are prepared to give us the benefit of the doubt. I hope they are. Um, and, uh, and there will be some permanent disgruntlement. But I, I just, I don't want, I think it's important to address these misconceptions here. The misconception that we're not making Raspberry Pis. We are, we're making lots and lots of Raspberry Pis. We're just making enough Raspberry Pis. The misconception that we are selling to IBM, that we're prioritizing huge, like, like business. Because business doesn't exist, right? Business is just people. Right, uh, and sometimes those businesses are quite small and quite fragile, um, uh, and so we we made a we made a judgment call. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to not having to make that judgment call anymore. If we could rewind history, back a, a, let's say a year or two years, right? What I think it's very unfair of you not to let me rewind history by three years because that's what <laughs> you actually need to do in order to make a difference. But uh, yeah, um, uh, two years. If you like, I say, if you can, if you if you if you allow me to rewind three years. More 2835s would have been great. This is the, the cheapest of the chips that we use in, in Raspberry Pi products. We could have afforded to stockpile and one or two million of those. Uh, and obviously that would have sustained zero in particular um, uh, all the way through. And that would have been a nice thing. If you, you, know, if you allow me two years, I think what we would have done, we would have got in front of, we would have got this active management scheme in place a lot earlier. Uh, we would have been much more proactive about getting in touch with our OEM customers and understanding their demand. Why is that important? We actually tried to, uh, the, that very anarchic, put units in the market and the market will take care of it, uh, is so core to who we are and so core to how we think about ourselves from a business perspective, that we really didn't want to give it up. But if you, don't, if, you, if you go down that route, what you end up doing is you end up, you end up empowering scalpers. And so you, you, know, you end up with, with boxes of units going out to people who've ordered them specifically to scalp them. <laughs> um, and that's, what, that's kind of the point of the active management is that you yeah. call someone up, you go on Zoom with someone, you look them in the eye and say, how many do you need? And they tell you, and you say, yeah, how many do you really need? <laughs> I, um, I do think that that's been working because earlier in the shortage, I was getting emails mm -hmm. from people saying, hey, I have a box of CM4s yeah. if you want to buy them. Yeah. I haven't gotten one of those yeah, in and that's, a few and, that, and that's horrible, right? Because, you know, those are units that are, you know, maybe they're still in someone's shed while they wait for the right price. I hope they still, I kind of slightly now because we're so close to the end of it, I kind of hope they are because I hope the person then gets rinsed when, uh, when they try to unload it's them. It's like into the toilet paper shortage. Yeah, that's it, right. Like you know, and yeah. a trailer full yeah, of toilet yeah, paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What am I supposed to do with this now, you know? Um, so, you know, yeah, when they turned off, when Amazon turned off um, uh, Amazon Marketplace and eBay turned off hand sanitizer sales <laughs> and these guys are like, but I have an entire house full of hand sanitizer. Well, you you know, tough, you know, shouldn't have done that. Um, so yeah, but yeah, maybe these are still in someone's shed waiting for the optimum moment to sell. Maybe they got bought by some company that was desperate when, you know, if they, if we could have held them to ourselves, we could have had a relationship with that customer, with, with that company. Uh, and we could have, cause we haven't put prices up, right? I mean, we put up, um, uh, Pi 42 gig went back to $45. Uh, all CM4s went up by $5. Um, and then we recently adjusted zero and zero W, but that's the and entirety even, of our pricing action. Right? Even inflation, you guys are still yeah. keeping down. Yeah, we're like, below inflation on almost everything, <laughs> right? You know, um, and you know, we're really married to those old to those old price points. Um, and and so, you know, what we haven't done is we haven't gone for the ultra capitalist kind of float the price because there is a you know a, what what am I what am I not sorry we didn't do? I'm not sorry that we didn't float the price and then let 
capitalism take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, that and would swim in the profits. Yeah, and swim in the profits. And, and oh, kill my, the, oh my and God. Kill the hobbyists yeah, oh my God. You altogether. know, I mean, you know, you could have, you know, the amount of money that we could have made if we'd float over the last couple of years, um, and you know, if we, if we'd, if we'd floated the price of the products. But I think that would have been a horrible betrayal of trust. I know how I feel when people do that to me. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad we didn't do that. I'm glad we went for the, it's been hugely labor intensive when you look at the commercial team here and the amount of effort that they put into, you know, this is not an organization that it is, was designed to maintain thousands of individual relationships with customers. That's just not what we built. Mm -hmm. uh, but fortunately, we had people in the commercial team here who have the aptitude. Call it anti-sales. Someone calls you and says, I want a thousand. Management. Yeah, 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 yeah. Someone calls you and says, I want a thousand of something. Usually, you would expect a good salesperson to say, uh, what do you, maybe you'd like 2,000. These days, our salespeople say, would you like 500? You know? um, <laughs> do you need yeah. a thousand? Do you need a thousand? When you say a thousand, are you going to build a thousand <laughs> units tomorrow? Or can I give you a hundred units now and a hundred units next month, right? Uh, just as the communications uh, function has, has had to bear some of the brunt of the of the kind of unhappiness about mm -hmm. about these decisions, the uh, the commercial team has had to bear the brunt of the, the, the kind of the labour um, of maintaining these these active relationships with OEMs. Switching tracks completely from the shortage to something that's in great surplus, the mm. RP twenty forty and the Pico. Yeah. What like that was some dumb luck, right? Yeah. <laughs> when I made my video about it, I I saw like oh, it looks like an Arduino, and that's you know maybe a little bit different, but. What has surprised you the most about that product? Um, I, well, as you say, it's been lovely to have a product which is in um, great surplus. It's 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 been good to have. Let's talk talk about some dumb luck, right? You know, if you had to pick a month for this thing, yeah. What yeah? What did, what are my regrets? Um, RP twenty forty came into availability volume availability in the first quarter of twenty uh, twenty twenty two, so about twelve months after the um, Pico launched. If I could have had six months earlier than that, I think we could have made much more contribution to helping people through the microcontroller bits of the semiconductor shortage. But I mean, I've just, I just—I guess I've been surprised by how quickly, and some of this is a function of the shortage environment. Um, I've been surprised by how quickly people have been prepared to adopt an, an entirely new architecture, right? You know, it's, it's an ARM chip, so it has a lot in common with other modern microcontrollers. Um, but a lot of the architectural decisions we made, which I think are good decisions, uh, make it unusual. Uh, as a platform. You know, I've been super impressed by how everyone, not just the kind of close-in guys, we had a few people who we provided with um, uh, early access. So we had uh, Adafruit uh, Arduino, which is lovely. You know, we love Arduino uh, uh, awf awfully much. Very inspired by Arduino. So uh, Adafruit, Arduino, Pimeroni, and SparkFun all had early access to the silicon, and they did predictably awesome stuff with it. Uh, <laughs> Out of the gates, you had yeah, 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 right. Cool I mean, they're brilliant, you know, and they were, they, you know, those are, I was super, I was, I was, I was super happy. To, to have that. There's a fun thing with Arduino where there is a mis other misconceptions. There's a misconception that Arduino and Raspberry Pi are competitors, uh, and it's hardly ever been the case. Actually, because we're in quite separate spaces, even now we're making microcontroller-based product, um, we're actually in very different spaces in terms of, 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 of um, if you have a particular problem, it is very seldom, even now Pico and Nano 2040 exist, um, it is very seldom the case that uh, there's genuinely any confusion as to which of the products you should use to solve your problem. And so, yeah, we've been friends with them for a long time. We're very inspired by them. They, were, they along with OLPC, were probably the two kind of hardware companies, hardware startups that kind of inspired us at Raspberry Pi. And so it was really wonderful to be able to, to see an Arduino product, an Arduino platform, which has been very successful, mm -hmm. um, built around our silicon. The nice thing about the RP2040 and the Pico is they've been available. And since Raspberry Pi designed the chips themselves, could they someday move to risk 5 and save on ARM licensing fees? I really wanted to get another perspective too. And I found out that Ian Cutris from Tech Tech Potato lives in London. In fact, I'm having a cuppa in one of his fancy mugs right now. He's an expert covering the chip industry, so I asked him what he thought about the prospect of a Pi on risk 5 The whole point about risk 5 is that it's this open source uh, ecosystem where anybody can add anything. Now, unfortunately, if anybody can add anything, it means everybody doesn't support everybody else. Yep. Um, so there has to be that next level of standardization. ARM already has that. Risk Five is getting there, just not yet. Yeah. Um, so I, I wouldn't fundamentally ever say Raspberry Pi would pivot to Risk Five. If if they were to go down that route, it would be the add-on. So what better follow-up to that than to ask Eben himself? 
What are your thoughts on whether that is something that could be in Raspberry Pi's future? Have you guys been yeah. involved in any kind of Risk Five design? Well, we're a, so we're a silver member of, of Risk Five International. Um, so we're we're a silver member of the the Risk Five Foundation. It's interesting. There are sort of split the world in two. There's what we call the A class view. We just use, I mean, ARM is so dominant now. You use ARM's words for everything. So you have the A class space and the M class space. You know, the big cores and the little cores. You know. um, in the A class space, there's there is a. I get. I, I tend to get. I tend to get flamed a little bit for, for saying this, but because uh, people people will say, ah, oh, but on GitHub you can find this excellent core that uh, is much more performant than anything I'll make. But um, there really is a shortage of good, licensable, high performance cores. Really high. Because yeah, remember, we we're shipping an A72 in Raspberry Pi four. So if Risk Five was going to go into a future Raspberry Pi, you need something which is much much more capable than A72. And there really aren't many cores in that space. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of A55 class cores, so the A, the, the in order cores. So there's a shortage of licensable cores. There's a still a lack of maturity in the software stacks um, in the in the um, uh, the particularly bits of the Linux user land are not well optimized at the moment for uh, for, for Risk Five architectures. Not to say that these challenges can't be overcome because there was a time when ARM had these challenges. You know, you compare ARM to Go back uh, ten or twenty years ago. Yeah, yeah, twenty years ago. I mean, it's still the case that if you go through. Pixman, say, you know, some 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 library of FFmpeg, Pixman, whatever, um, and you look for fast paths, the place is crawling with Intel fast paths. You know, everything from MNX to SSE and, and onward, there are fast paths for every generation of, of Intel multimedia acceleration instruction. Um, and on the ARM side, you have a handful of Cortex-A8 stuff that Nokia did 15 years ago, and then you have a trail of, of ARM 11, uh, Cortex A7, Cortex A53, and Cortex A72 optimization. See what you can see what those all have in common um, that some other company contributed over the years. So, you know, even the ARM world is pretty immature compared to the Intel world. The, the Risk V world is immature mm -hmm. then compared to the ARM world. That can be overcome, and ARM overcame it to a not to a gr not completely, but to a sufficient degree. Uh, and I'm sure Risk V can do that, but it's going to take years. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a chicken and egg. Uh, there is a chicken and egg problem, you know. ARM are very, very entrenched in that space. Microcontroller is more interesting, yeah. right? Because the software stacks are shallower, the cores are simpler, the software stacks are shallower. There are a lot of places you can go and license an M class um, a risk a, a risk five core. And so I do think, and you are seeing that now, right? Particularly mm -hmm. the ultra low end. Um, I do think there are opportunities to uh, for for people to go build risk five um, um, microcontrollers. Uh, would we do it? Um, I don't know. I mean, the ARM, the ARM value proposition is really strong, right? Yeah. It's a really strong community, and it's not expensive to play in it. I've been yeah. working with an Ampere yeah. Ultra Max system. Yeah, I've seen you. I've seen you. I've seen your tweets. It's been yes. very fun like having ARM. that much power in that small of a yeah. space yeah. in the ARM world, and then you know the M1, M2 chips. Yeah. We were really pleased to have launched Pi 400 the week before the M1 Max because it meant that yeah, as a child I'd lost it over these Acorn Archimedes machines which had ARM ARM twos in them, um, and then and then we they were then absent for 20 years from the desktop space and we got yep. back in a week. We were the first back in the door by about a week before um, yep. the other fruit company came well, along. So and that was nice. My kids are mm. learning computing on a Pi 400. Yeah, That's, it's a lovely platform, right? And one of the cool things about one of the cool things that's happened over the last few weeks, I think, is that 400 is coming back into yes. another gym. Well, it's not extensively tracked, but yeah. it is. I, I went to Micro Center mm. and they had Pi 400. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, they had, I think, three or four in stock. Yes. Yeah. And they said that they had gotten a few Pi 4s a couple mm. weeks before. Yeah. Right now, I'm not buying any because I want other people to get oh, them. That's very good of you. Thank you. <laughs> Once they Thank you for your uncustom. We always have this, you know, it's like everything is, is we're in upside down world at the moment. Um, uh, but, but yeah, it's, um, so I think I, I would so kind of say never say never. I think microcontroller is more plausible than A class. A class will be, may become plausible in a few years, um, but M class is M class is definitely is definitely feasible, and I, I definitely wouldn't wouldn't commit to not do it. I actually posted a lot more about the idea of Risk V and the Pi on my website, so if you want to go deeper, check out the link below. Raspberry Pi might not be fully committed to Risk V, but they are fully committed with Sony now, judging by the fact that Sony bought a minority stake in Raspberry Pi this year. I asked Eben about it. We've been working with Sony for 11 years in contract manufacturing. Um, so we are uh, the biggest, the oldest, and still by revenue vastly the biggest um, uh, relationship we have with Sony is contract manufacturing. Almost every uh, Raspberry Pi product, certainly every core Raspberry Pi product is now manufactured for us by Sony. Um, most of it in uh, South Wales, in Pencoid. 
Um, so that's the oldest relationship. Uh, we have an image sensor relationship with them that dates back to 2016. So we have what is, whatever that is now, a seven year relationship. Is that the with them. V2 camera? That was the V2 camera. Yeah. So the first camera was an Omnivision camera. That sensor got EOL'd. Uh, and then we did the 219 camera. It was our only camera product for a long time. And then we did the HQ camera with 477 in it. Um, and then the V3 camera with 708. And then the global shutter camera with 296. So he guys, says, my brain is just full of numbers. Are you, planning, are you planning on becoming a camera company at some point? Well, that's it. I mean, the interesting <laughs> thing is, you know, those are, they're great products, right? And yeah. they're, I mean, they're great products. Um, they're, they're, you know, they, I you know, Commercially, you know, we make money from them. Um, they also make the platform, the, the the overall kind of Raspberry Pi platform, the Raspberry Pi ecosystem stickier because it's where these nice cameras are. You actually see people figuring out how to plug our cameras into other people's into other people's SPCs, which is kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, and I never feel I never feel bad about that. You know, I'm always happy to happy to take the margin from that and get, get Raspberry Pi logos in more places. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they're great, and I mean, Sony, Sony, so Sony have, have been a great partner, and then they've they've got some really nice capabilities in AI. We've never we've never integrated AI into the core product, AI acceleration into the core product. I don't think we ever will. Yeah. Um, and the reason we won't is because it will only ever be of interest to a minority, but potentially a sizable minority, but a, a minority of our customers. It's quite an expensive feature to put on the board, and if you think you're taxing every customer to pay for a thing which is only of interest to 10% of people. We're reaching a $35 price point. Yeah, yeah, right. You can't just yeah. throw it on. There. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And, I mean, you told us that, see, I mean, the sort of the, the, the most incredible example of this it remains the lack of an ADC on a Raspberry Pi. You know, an ADC is a 20 cent I2C component, um, but we've it's never made it onto the Pi. Why is it never made it onto the Pi? Because if it's only of use to 5% of people, then you kind of count a 20, a 20 cent component. We always kind of divide through by the fraction. So you imagine a, mm -hmm. a, a 20 cent component that's used by 5% of people is a $4 component in our, in our mm -hmm. reasoning. The only, what's the only capability that a modern Raspberry Pi has that a Raspberry Pi 1 didn't have? Wireless networking, right? That's the only uh, uh, qualitative difference. There are lots of quantitative differences. There are more, more memory, faster processors. Um, to HDMI ports. To, to HDMI ports. Lots of, lots of those things. The only actual qualitative change to the platform that ever made it through that filter is wireless networking. So I don't think AI is going to go in the core platform, but there are opportunities using some of the products Sony has to add AI as an accessory product mm -hmm. to the Pi. This year, everyone's doing AI on text. Um, but... Um, Historically, what has everyone been doing AI on? People have been doing AI on images where what they've been capturing the images with a camera. So it probably makes more sense to have an integrated, an offering which is an integrated camera with AI acceleration and then a non AI accelerated baseboard than it does to, to, to yeah, if you want a two box, right now you can do a three box solution. You can buy an HQ cam, a Raspberry Pi, and a Coral accelerators you've got a three box solution if you want to go to a two box solution there are two partitions one where you put the acceleration on the core product can't do that the other one where you put the acceleration on the image capture device could do that and i think that's probably what this opens the door to so ai camera coming when oh <laughs> uh, yeah yeah it's not a product announcement but, uh, yeah. but it's certainly you know you look at their lineup of you look at that you look at yeah. their product lineup and i think there are opportunities to build really 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 interesting products there so i also asked especially if half of all raspberry pis end up in industry do you prioritize things like edge compute when you're building the next Pi? Are there conflicting priorities like commercial versus educational use? The good thing about the product design is we've never had to prioritize in that way. You know, people say, oh, what decisions did you make for, you know, we have compute modules. So we have an actual platform. You've got Pi 400 and, and, and compute module. So you've got the, the parent product, the SPC, and then you've got something which is obviously derived for industry and something which is obviously derived for consumer. That they reuse a lot of the the core. Most of the money gets spent on the core platform. I'm always trying to educate people that that's when, when you're doing a development, that's where the, the money goes. But the core platform, we've never made a decision. I don't think to target one or the other. And the core platform is still the bulk of our business. So yeah, in a seven million unit year, we're probably doing five million units of the of the SBC, and they're selling into both markets. Um, there are no decisions that you make to make it specifically useful for industry or, or, or specifically useful for a, for a hobbyist. And I, I think... Um, the, just make it better. I think the, the interesting thing is I've, from a lot of the business users of it, including my dad, mm. who doesn't... He uses them for remote right. access at tower sites. The whole reason they like it is because it's so easy mm. for a hobbyist or a maker that it's also easy for you to pick it up and use it in, in other mm. projects. That's it. They're the same... They're the, they're the same capabilities they're the same um uh you know they're the same the same platform capabilities are useful to both groups um and often you know both groups 
the, both groups are actually the same people. You yeah. know, the hobbyists. You know, why is Raspberry Pi so popular in industry? It's, it's popular in industry because it's popular with hobbyists who happen to be design engineers, and they take it with them into 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 their professional lives. Or people that are trying yeah. to build a petabyte storage solution. Yeah, that's it. That, exactly, <laughs> exactly those, exactly those people. It's actually kind of important. There is a there is an angle there which is it's actually important. You know, these are. You know, we, we're talking about businesses. Even, even when we're talking about somewhat larger businesses, you are you are talking about individuals. If a larger business has designed a Raspberry Pi into a platform, someone made that recommendation, right? Somebody in the organisation stuck their neck out and said to their boss, "You should use." this platform there's nothing will go wrong if you use this platform those are real people who would have and it's another class of real people not just your mom and pop business owners that's another class of person who would have been very severely impacted if we had then either by pushing through price changes or by zeroing um oems mm -hmm. um uh, those are it's another class of person who would have been personally impacted by that decision it's not to say it wasn't a decision that could have been made yeah. Um, but it's not a it's not a costless decision, and it's not it's not a decision that only impacts uh, corporations. Uh, switching tracks a little bit, uh, I asked on my Discord if anybody had any questions, and the best question was, why Raspberry? Why? Oh, uh, Raspberry! Um, Raspberry is fruit named computer companies. There have been several uh, large computer companies named after fruit. Uh, we had an apricot in the UK. We had a tangerine, actually here in Cambridge. Acorn is, I think, a fruit. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, there's lots of there's lots of fruit and computer companies. I think I'm, I might have missed another one out somewhere. Um, so there is that. A, a raspberry is also the rudest. Is also the rudest fruit um, because I don't know in American English if it if it's if it's like. Pfft. You now as I'm blowing a raspberry, um, yep. so and we and yeah, we're talking, yeah, talking to talking to children. You know, they, um, Roald Dahl had this thing where she, he said that they, you know, uh, the the, the uh, you know, the best thing for a kid, the funniest thing for a kid is when an adult farts, right? Um, and the funniest thing that could ever, ever, ever happen would be if the Queen were to fart. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, there's a, there's a certain kind of puerile um, uh, um, love of, uh, of raspberry for that reason. And then pie, of course, is, is Python. Uh, pie is Python, and also a feeling that the the letter Pi would make a nice would make a nice logo, and we've ended up with a picture of a, and we've ended up with a picture of a raspberry. And you have an annual day of celebration. Pie we day. do have an annual day of celebration, and only a, uh, I mean, obviously, I celebrate it on the because I'm an engineer, not a scientist. I celebrate it on the um, uh, the twenty second of uh, the twenty second of July. <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> It could be worse. I could celebrate it on the 3rd of January, I suppose. But. Before I leave and conclude, I have to say, can you commit to supporting PCI Express better on the next generation of Raspberry Pi whenever that comes out? Yeah, I think we can. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the 64-bit thing is not ideal. I, it really upsets me that we can't drive the, 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 the Google TPU um, uh, using the... I mean, it upsets me that... You know, that, that it doesn't I, upset you that I can't drive a 4090? Um, it, it's, I, it, it upsets me a little tiny bit. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah you, when you say better, um, I'm going to be fascinated. <laughs> because because you know, that really is kind of like pushing right at the limits. You have to remember the PCI Express controller that's in 2711 was designed to drive Wi-Fi chips. <laughs> right, a spe uh, the specific companies, Wi-Fi chips, are uh, a large manufacturer of Wi-Fi chips. Uh, and based, you got it to work with USB three. Yeah, that's it. And it worked with it worked with VL eight hundred five, which was a good, which was you know a bit a bit of good luck. Um, uh, but you know, it's not by any means a PC, PCI Express um, uh, mm -hmm. controller. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, we've been happy with the range of devices that it will drive. Um, yeah, I think we'll try and do it whenever we do. And the interesting thing about Raspberry Pi Five, we've been knocked back. You know, this is a, this is a product where um, you know you know what our product release cycles look like um, it, it, before the pandemic. Before released. the pandemic, you know, if you <laughs> it does still feel on some level like it's April twenty twenty, and if it's April twenty twenty, then Raspberry Pi Four must be ten months old, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we've been knocked back a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think we, we, we're now getting to a point where we can actually think about the next thing mm -hmm. um, a, a little bit more. What do you want the legacy of Raspberry Pi to be? Oh, I would want the legacy to be. Oh, that's really, really simple. Um, I One of the nice things for me about Raspberry Pi is, um, uh, for me, uh, from just a personal perspective, is that I got to meet most of my heroes. So I got to meet the people who built the BBC Micro, which was the machine I had when I was a child. Um, and um, I got to say thanks. 
Um, uh, and in fact, I had the good luck to work with Sophie Wilson, who was, who was both the person who wrote BBC Basic and also the person who designed the instruction set for the 32-bit the ARM instruction set. Uh, I, got, I got to work with her for many years. Um, but I've met almost all the Acon people. Um, and so I'd like my legacy to be, I'd like there to be one person who looks back on, we sold 50 million Raspberry Pis now, right? Um, and millions of them, although, you know, probably industrial consumption, even, you know, in an unconstrained year, industrial consumption would be well over half of Raspberry Pis. That's still millions and millions and millions of units going into the hobbyist and education community. I would like it if there was one person out of all those people who is, has the affection for the Raspberry Pi that I have for the BBC Micro, because I owe everything, uh, including having met Liz, who I co-founded this thing with, um, uh, I owe all of that to the little beige box in the corner of my bedroom that goes beep, beep when you turn it on and gives you a basic prompt. Well, the Raspberry Pi has certainly made an impact. The last thing we discussed was what's coming in the next 10 years of Raspberry Pi. The franchise won. If you sort of think of, of making electronic products as being the first the thing we, we still accounts the thing we did first, it's the thing that accounts for the majority of our business. Um, uh, if you think of that as being franchise one and you think of doing semiconductors, RP2040 as being franchise two, even in franchise one, there's a lot of cool stuff to do, even before you start thinking about the new things you unlock, if you allow people to buy, if you put people in a position to buy um, uh, the, the the chip that powers a Raspberry Pi beacon. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much. And speaking of that legacy, I do admire your work, but I am not thank somebody you. who grew up on it. Well, that's it. I already had my passion yeah. for computing. Yeah. So. Uh, well, what I'd like is, I mean, of course, you're, you're, you're somebody who's always had a, a passion for it. A thing that I found, um, a thing that I found really heartening, actually, is particularly somewhere like the UK, where, you, where there was a big groundswell of excitement about computing in the 1980s, um, when you meet somebody who drifted away from it. And, you know, we do have people, you know, certainly in the early days, um, people who would say, man, I used to love this when I was a kid and I just stopped doing mm -hmm. it and now I'm doing it again and it makes me happy. Yep. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a fun. That is a common refrain. It's a fun, it's a fun thing, right? So, and, you know, um, you know, who can tell where we'll be in a year's time, right? Well, thank you very no, much. Well, no, well, thank you, though. Thank you for, I mean, like I say, you've come, you probably hold the record for having come the furthest to see Pi Towers. It is, <laughs> it is cubicle land, but uh, it's, it's cubicle land, it's, but it's, it's cubicle It land. looks like it's expanding. This room yeah. that we're in, it, apparently it keeps uh, being pushed back further and further. Yeah, this room is, this room is probably, you may be one of the last people to experience meeting room three and it's, and it's, <laughs> Uh, hotter sibling meeting room four um, uh, before the thing gets turned into more cubicle land. So anyway, well, thank you again. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Raspberry Pi for allowing me to visit, all of you for watching, pieshop.us for the sponsorship, and a huge, huge thanks to everyone who supported this channel on Patreon, GitHub sponsors, or YouTube memberships. I couldn't have done this without you, nor could I have visited the Sony factory in Wales where they make Raspberry Pis. Subscribe because you definitely don't want to miss that video. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.